Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 181. Today, we are going to be looking at an unsolved case from the 70s, which is still being investigated to this day. And hopefully, one day there will be answers. But so far, there's been a major lack of justice here. And so we wanted to speak on this case. We're going to be talking about the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. And just a warning, this one is definitely intense, could be triggering to some. And yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a really a tough one to to go through, but it's an important one. I it mean, is. A lot of these older cases, especially, I mean, you go back into the 1970s and just the police work back then. And, and also the mm-hmm. way that they were able to test evidence was just not obviously not up to what we have today. Right. So and a I lot think of things, yeah, slipped through the cracks. So absolutely. Sorry to cut you off there, but yeah, I think it's important to keep that in mind while listening to this, you know, this happened a right. long time ago. The way that we investigate cases now is completely different. So it's a very frustrating case to listen to knowing what we know now but it's yeah it's important to keep that in mind throughout because i mean there's so many cold cases from you know 60s 70s and 80s and that doesn't mean that they can never be solved right Mm -hmm. like they can be solved 50 100 years later so it's always good to keep awareness around the case yeah have people learn about it because you never know i mean there might be somebody out there that maybe has a relative or somebody that might know something about what what had actually happened here and i mean the the murders of these young girls is like you said it was very very gruesome so just just uh, keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, we're going to go ahead and dive right into this. This episode of Mile Higher Podcast is actually brought to you by Native Upstart Candid Warby Parker and Amazon Music. So we're going to begin this case by talking a little bit about the victims, which were Doris Milner, Lori Farmer, and Michelle Gousset. And we're just there's not a ton of information. This was a tough one because it was pretty mm-hmm. poorly reported on. There's mm-hmm. There's like a documentary from the 80s that was put out on Discovery, and that's like basically it. Yeah. And then obviously news publications, and there's a couple websites out there that have been following the case for mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. But as far as the background on the girls, there's not a whole bunch. But we're going to begin by talking about Lori Lee Farmer. So Lori was born on June 18th, 1968 in Little Rock, Arkansas. And at the time of all of this, Lori was eight years old living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and was raised by her parents, Sherry and Dr. Bo Charles. Their family had recently moved from Little Rock to Tulsa, and Sherry was a stay-at-home mother, and Lori's father was the emergency department director at St. John Medical Center. Lori was the oldest of five children. She had three sisters, Misty, Jolie, and Callie, and a brother named Chad. Now, Lori was the youngest of the three victims that we will be talking about today, but she was considered to be very bright and mature for her age. In fact, Lori had skipped the second grade entirely. Lori attended Jenks Elementary School in Jenks, Oklahoma, and was looking forward to starting the fifth grade in the fall. Lori's mother has said that being the oldest of five, she was mature, she was smart, and really, really pretty. She was just a really good older sister to her younger siblings. When summer started approaching, both Lori and her mother wanted Lori to participate in some sort of camp activity that year. She said that she encouraged Lori to go to summer camp, and she said that everyone was going somewhere to camp this year. Lori wanted to go to either Camp Scott, which is a Girl Scout camp, or a summer camp that was run by the local YMCA. Sherry said that ultimately they decided that Lori should attend Camp Scott, and it was a decision that has haunted her every day. She said, primarily, I was the one who chose the Girl Scout camp over the YMCA camp, and that's something that I have to deal with myself in that that was my decision. I had a hard time not letting her go this particular year because everyone was going somewhere to camp. She wasn't real adamant about it being Girl Scout camp. She wanted to go somewhere to a camp, and she had actually picked two, the Y camp and Girl Scout camp. Primarily, I was the one who chose the Girl Scout camp over the Y camp. And that's something that that I have to deal with myself and that that was my decision. Also, the week that Lori went to camp was my decision. And that's a decision that rests pretty heavily with me. So now let's talk about Michelle Gousset. Michelle Heather Gousset was born on July 22, 1967 in Miami, Oklahoma. 
I didn't know there was a Miami, Oklahoma. Yeah, I to had to honest. look I had to look that up too. I was like, Miami, Oklahoma. Wow. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's like a little, little town in Oklahoma called Miami. I wonder how similar to actual Miami it is. Probably nothing. <laughs> Probably very different. Nothing similar about it. At the time of all of this, Michelle was nine years old and living in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, with her parents Richard and George Ann, who also went by Curdy and her brother, Michael. Michelle was known for being active and athletic, as well as intelligent and a little bit shy. She played soccer and enjoyed reading. She loved to spend her time with her older brother, Mike. In 1977 would be the second year Michelle attended Camp Scott after she enjoyed two weeks there the prior year. Michelle loved to tend to her plants, especially her flowers, particularly her favorite African violets. And Michelle's mother said that before leaving for camp, she was very concerned about the care of her prized violets. So she had asked her mother to take care of them while she was gone. She was very excited and she came downstairs and uh, sat on my lap and told me that she was going to miss me. But she wanted to make sure that I would uh, take care of her plants. And her African violets were her specialty and she wanted to make sure that I would water them and take care of them. So the final victim we are going to be talking about today is Doris Milner, who also went by Denise. She was born on February 5th, 1967, and was 10 years old at the time, living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with her parents, Betty and Walter, and her five-year-old sister, Kathleen. Her mother was a hospital lab technician, and her father was a police officer in Tulsa. Denise was brilliant and was a straight-A student. She had recently been accepted to a prestigious school for exceptional children in Tulsa called Carver Middle School. Denise was very excited to start her new school in the fall. Her and her sister Kathleen were very close and enjoyed spending a lot of their time playing together and watching TV. So her upcoming trip to Camp Scott would be Denise's first camping trip. And to pay for the trip, Denise actually sold boxes of Girl Scout cookies for her local troop and saved up the money to go. Denise would also be one of the few African-American attendees at the camp. And in the days leading up to Denise's departure for Camp Scott, the excitement that she once had for the camping trip was quickly replaced with a lot of anxiety. She started feeling anxious about, you know, the unknown. She had never been before, meeting new kids, all the typical anxieties you have as a child. I was always terrified to go to camp and would, like, do yeah, anything. Yeah, you were. I loved camp. I spent a lot of my time at camp, like, in the infirmary, hiding from people and wanting to go home and crying to my mom. <laughs> I never went to camp for that exact reason. <laughs> yeah, it was rough for me. <laughs> I spent my time in girls' cabins. You, nasty. you better not say entertaining, that ever again. Entertaining, entertaining. I was young. Okay, yeah. being, and, and being the, scene the on clown. that one. <laughs> but she started telling her mother that she didn't want to go because she was feeling so anxious. Denise did have a few friends who were planning to also go to camp with her, but they pulled out of the trip last minute, and that meant Denise was going to have to go alone, which really freaked her out, understandably. Further, she was the most nervous about being without her mother and little sister for two weeks straight. That's a long time, especially as a kid. Yeah. But Denise's mother, Betty, convinced her to go to the camp anyway, believing that it would be good for her daughter to attend. I mean, she understood her daughter's apprehension, but she said she convinced her to go because she thought it would help her be more independent. And if she didn't like it at all, then all she had to do was call and they would come get her so she didn't have to stay. She was getting weird about going. She, was about, she had decided she really didn't want to go. She wasn't sure that she would like it. But I convinced her that she should go and try it, that it would help her be more independent. And that if she didn't like it, all she had to do was call and we would come and get her and that she didn't have to stay. And when Denise went to camp, Betty had a very haunting conversation with her youngest daughter, Kathleen. Kathleen, who was only five years old at the time, randomly turned to her mother and asked, what happens when people die? Betty tried her best to answer this question in a way that her young daughter could understand. And then Kathy asked Betty, well, what if everyone dies? Betty then explained to her youngest that although people die, new babies are born every day and the cycle of life repeats itself. But then Kathy's most haunting statement came next. She looked right at her mother and told her, Mama, tomorrow, everybody's going to die. And the very next day, June 13th, 1977, Denise, Lori, and Michelle would all be brutally murdered at Camp Scott. That's so chilling, man. That she literally had a premonition about the murders. It's crazy. It's truly terrifying. Oh, God. So... Camp Scott. Let's talk about Camp Scott for a moment here. So Camp Scott was located in Locust Grove, Oklahoma, which is basically east of Tulsa. It looks like a couple hours east of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it was constructed in 1928. And originally the camp was called 
Ma Del Co. But Camp Scott first opened the grounds to campers on August 11, 1928. So a very, very old camp. The property was sprawling and densely wooded area of 410 acres that could fit 140 campers and 30 counselors. And at the time, a five-day stay was $5, equivalent wow. to about $80 in today's money. That's a deal. Well, it's $80 at the time. Yeah, but still $80 yeah. today? That's a deal. Yeah, it's not too bad. Can't get camp like that nowadays. Absolutely not. No. Activities at Camp Scott included swimming, CPR training, archery, pathfinding, bridge building, bird studies, insect life studies, and leadership skills. The camp was located in Oklahoma's Cookson Hills, which is a region known for its thick woods, unspoiled nature, isolation, and solitude. In the past, outlaws and fugitives have historically sought refuge in the Cookson Hills while on the run from law enforcement. So within Camp Scott, there are 11 different campsite units, and each campsite unit contained approximately seven tents for campers and one tent for counselors. The tents were 12 by 14 feet in size and fit three to four cots for campers. These are like big, almost like military style tents. Mm. I was in Cub Scouts for, for a bit and I went to Cub Scout camp actually in Oklahoma. It wasn't this area. Actually, I just, I just looked it up and it was called Dripping Springs Boy Scout camp. But we stayed in these big tents that so that you could put cots in there versus like sleeping on mm, sleeping bags mm -hmm. on the floor right um they're big they have kind of like big flaps to go into them Damn, but no yeah. cabins or anything no this was no, no bunk beds no if you're in like if you go to scout camp i mean it's like it's camping it's not oh. not cabin camping I, <laughs> I went uh cabin camping when i went to church camp i but went anyways. to girl scout camp and there were bunk beds and cabins Really? Well, it yeah. wasn't for, but I'm saying if you go as a Cub Scout or a Girl Scout, you are going to a Girl Scout camp, oh, not right, as a yeah. scout. True. True. <laughs> I only made it one year in Scouts. Yeah. If that. Yeah. <laughs> Kendall and Scouts camp. Yeah, I know. That's, that. a, that's a funny, funny sight <laughs> to see. It did not go well. <laughs> Ten of the campsites were actually named after different Native American tribes. And staff inevitably signed Lori, Denise, and Michelle to the Kiowa campsite. The Kiowa campsite included eight tents arranged in a horseshoe shape a kitchen, storage, and a shower facility, an outhouse or latrine, and a campfire pit. Tent one was the counselor tent, and the three girls were placed in the eighth tent. However, there's the reports vary on whether the girls were in tent seven or eight, depending on if you count the counselor's tent as tent number one. But for the sake of, of this podcast, we're going to refer to Lori and Denise and Michelle's tent as tent number eight. The eighth tent was also the furthest from the counselor's tent and closest to the outhouse. So it's important to note that the kitchen storage and shower facility obscured the counselor's tent's view of tent number eight, which this right here is like a red flag because yeah. they are probably way too young to be camping by themselves in a tent. First of all, mm -hmm. when I was this age in Cub Scouts, we had a, an adult in every single tent. Yeah. And that's probably something that changed after after, after this event. This. Yeah. Right. So before Camp Scott started the summer of June 1977, they actually held a training session for the upcoming season's counselors and volunteers. 15-year-old Michelle Hoffman was one of the attendees of this pre-summer training session as she was set to work as a counselor that year. The training session took place in April, about two months before all of this took place. During the session, Michelle returned to her cabin and found an unexpected and frightening scene. She first noticed that someone had thrown her suitcases outside and moved the bags inside around. And Michelle also saw that someone had completely emptied out a box of donuts designated for the counselors. And she also found some threatening notes inside of a notebook that said, kill, kill, kill. And this had been written all over the first two to three pages of the notebook. And on one of the pages, someone wrote in all caps, we are on a mission to kill three girls in tent one. Some records show that a group of counselors admitted that the notes were them doing this which is really bizarre and weird mm -hmm. while other reports state that michelle assumed that it's just a prank yeah. and dismissed this incident entirely but maybe it wasn't just a prank mm -hmm. nevertheless camp staff did nothing to investigate these claims thoroughly and this note would actually be brought up later on during the murder trial and because it was could have been a warning that was completely neglected that could have maybe yeah. You know, stop this from happening altogether if they had actually taken it seriously. But I do think it's important to remember this was a long time ago right. and, you know, they just didn't have those policies set up. You know, mm -hmm. thankfully it's much different now, but it was a different time. 
yeah i mean well pranks were like such a i mean even in, when mm-hmm. we were young camp and stuff we did pranks all yeah. the time and how old are these counselors you know young. it's not I mean, like she's they have much teenager, training and right. anything like that mm-hmm. so, so it's hard to plus say people do prank at camps all the time so i'm not you know rationalizing what they did it was a huge mistake but i do think the time that this happened says a lot about how they acted. true but it is very eerie they said kill three girls yeah i mean no that's because that's that, like that literally what happened so on june 12th 1977 130 young girl scouts were set to board a bus and depart for camp scott from tulsa girl scout headquarters as they said goodbye to their families they boarded the leather scented bus to begin what they thought would be a two-week adventure michelle hoffman later shared that denise caught her attention for two reasons the first was that Denise was one of the few African-American girls on the trip, and the other was that she was notably more nervous than her Girl Scout counterparts, because again, this is her first mm-hmm. time going to camp. So totally, you know, I would expect that from her. She remembered that Denise's mother had actually gotten on board the bus to tell Denise that she could call home if she started to feel uncomfortable. And Michelle actually sat alongside Denise for the entire bus ride to Camp Scott. Michelle helped ease her nerves by telling her stories and explaining to Denise how much fun she would be having. Upon their arrival, Michelle even let Denise know that she would be sleeping in her all-time favorite tent, number eight, which she favored because it was closest to the bathroom. While some counselors favor tent number eight, it is important to remember that, again, it wasn't visible from the counselor's tent. It's horrible. So there was a bunch of other camp facilities and dense scenery that blocked it. When they got there, the camp staff assigned the girls to the Kiowa tent, and on the night of June 12, 1977, the girls spent hours getting to know their fellow campers and making their new friends. Now, before we get into the events on the night of June 13, 1977, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Since you're listening to the show, I think it's safe to say you love listening to podcasts, right? Well, you'll find a ton of binge-worthy podcasts, including ours, on Amazon Music. Amazon Music has more than 10 million free podcast episodes to listen to, but Amazon Music isn't just for listening to podcasts. They have thousands of music stations and top playlists to stream for free. And no matter what you're listening to, you can go hands-free with Alexa. If you have an Alexa at home, you can literally ask it to play Alexa, play Mile Higher Podcast, and it will actually play, which is awesome. If you're like me and you want your music on demand and ad-free, you have to try Amazon Music Unlimited. This gives you unlimited access to over 75 million songs, plus podcasts, music videos, and more. With Amazon Music Unlimited, you can listen to any song anywhere offline with unlimited skips. I actually use Amazon Music on my phone, and when I get in my truck, my truck actually has Alexa in it, so I'm able to verbally tell Alexa what I want to listen to, and it just puts it on for me. That way I don't have to mess with the controls or try to change things when I'm driving. Alexa just does all of it for me, and that's only possible with Amazon Music Unlimited. I use it to listen to all my favorite podcasts as well as all my favorite music playlists. And I love the fact that it's all on demand and I can skip songs for free and there's no ads, which I absolutely love. So if you've never tried Amazon Music Unlimited, now's a great time. For a limited time, new customers can try Amazon Music Unlimited free for three months. No credit card required. Just go to amazon.com slash milehigherpod. That's amazon.com slash milehigherpod to try Amazon Music Unlimited free for three months. Again, that's amazon.com slash milehigherpod. It renews automatically, but you can cancel anytime. Terms apply. So we can officially say we are in the holiday season. I think most of us agree that once we're in November, we're kind of in the holiday season. And my favorite part of this time of the year is all of the smells. Everything smells amazing. And speaking of things that smell good, I have to tell you about Native's new holiday-inspired scented products. Native cares about the products that you put on your body. They're all about stopping the stink the right way. That's a Native difference. You've heard us talk about Native's legendary aluminum-free deodorant before and Native's mission to overhaul your entire hygiene routine by creating products that are made with simple ingredients like shea butter and coconut oil so you can smell great all day long. With classics and rotating seasonals, Native really has a scent for everyone. Check out their new holiday scented deodorant, body wash, or toothpaste in scents like candy cane, sugar cookie, and fresh mistletoe for a limited time. Giving the gift of self-care is easy with Native. You can build yourself or your loved one's personalized product bundles by mixing and matching three of your favorite holiday scented products into a set. Last year, I was so obsessed with the sugar cookie deodorant and the candy cane toothpaste. Ugh, so, so good. 
It really gets you in the holiday vibe every time you go to do your self-care routine. Stay merry, happy, and fresh this holiday season. You will love Native's limited time seasonal products as much as we do. Just go to nativedeodorant.com and use code MILEHIRE20 to get 20% off your first purchase at checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com, code MILEHIRE20 for 20% off. nativedeodorant.com, code MILEHIRE20. What would you do if you didn't have high interest loans or credit card debt? With Upstart, you can pay off your existing debt quickly and easily and start living your life. I know I have said this a million times, but credit card debt is real. We all deal with it. And when I was young, getting out of college, I had a bunch of credit card debt and I was just paying the minimum every single month. And it just was racking up and up and up. And I was paying tons of interest and never actually paying off my debt. But that's where a personal loan came in handy and was able to consolidate that debt and allow me to pay one monthly payment. And I was able to get all of that debt paid off in like six months and got me debt free, which is an absolutely amazing feeling. So Upstart is the fast and easy way to help you pay off your debt with a personal loan all in line. It's great because you can use it to pay off credit card debts or consolidate high interest debt or just fund personal expenses, which over a million people have used Upstart in order to get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. What's different about Upstart is that rather than looking at just your credit score, they consider other factors like your income, current employment, and credit history in order to help you find a smarter rate for your loan, which is really cool. A lot of places don't do that for you. You can check your rate without impacting your credit score in minutes, which is awesome, and loans come between $1,000 to $50,000, and you can receive your funds as fast as one business day after you accept the terms of your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash mile higher. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. And don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. Again, that's upstart.com slash mile higher. So that summer, it had been a particularly hot summer season. But the night of June 13th, 1977, they had rain and thunderstorms. Now, there was another little girl named Angela Sweet, who was 10 years old at the time and was initially supposed to stay in tent number eight along with Lori, Denise, and Michelle after her original tent assignment with a different troop ran out of space. So Angela prepared to stay the night in tent eight and began getting close with her soon-to-be tent mates. The four girls put their suitcases in their tent, used the bathroom, and spent time around the campfire together that night. Now, this outing to the bathroom would be the first known indication that the girls were not alone out in these woods. As the four of them walked alongside one another, they spotted three flashlights in the nearby woods. Now, luckily for Angela, her life was saved when counselors found space for her within the tents that were occupied by her original troop. So as all 27 girls in the Kiowa campsite shuffled into their tents for the night, Lori, Denise, and Michelle decided to write letters back home. And these letters would end up being their last their family ever heard from them again. So Lori's letter said, Dear Mom, Dad, and Misty, and Joe, and Chad, and Kathy. We're just getting ready to go to bed. It's 745. We're at the beginning of a storm and having a lot of fun. I've met two new friends, Michelle Gousset and Denise Milner. I'm sharing a tent with them. It started raining on the way back from dinner. We're sleeping on cots. I couldn't wait to write. We're all writing letters now because there's hardly anything else to do. With love, Lori. Michelle's letter said, Dear Aunt Karen, how are you? I am fine. I am writing from camp. We can't go outside because it's storming. Me and my tent mates are in the last tent in our unit. My tent mates are Denise Milner and Lori Farmner. My room is in shades of purple. Love, Michelle. And Denise's letter was very upsetting to hear. She expressed to her mom that she didn't like camp and wanted to go home. Dear mom, I don't like camp. It's awful. The first day it rained. I have three new friends named Glenda, Lori, and Michelle. Michelle and Lori are my roommates. Mom, I don't want to stay at camp for two weeks. I want to come home and see Cassie and everybody. Your loving child, Denise Milner. Oh, that's very sweet. I know. Sad too. It's just crazy. They were so young. I know. On the night of June 13th, 1977, not only was it raining and thunderstorming, but it's been reported that counselors and campers saw strange noises and sights that night as well. Between 11.30 p.m. and 1.30 a.m., the three counselors on duty at Kiowa heard various noises outside. And these counselors were 18-year-old Carlo Wilty, 18-year-old Susan Ewing, and 20-year-old D. Elder. Some of these noises were noted as excitable chatter from the young girls on their first night of camp, but other noises would later be identified as cries for help from Lori, Denise, and Michelle. 
Sometime around 1.30 a.m., the disturbing sounds awoke Counselor Carla. She described these noises as suspicious, intermittent moaning that didn't sound like human or animal noises coming from the area near tent number eight. And because the moaning seemed to stop, Carla decided to take a brief walk around, but noticed nothing odd going on and decided to return to her tent. Another counselor reported seeing a dim light coming from the woods. This counselor followed the light with her eyes as it headed toward the Kiowa campsite. But when the light disappeared, so did her interest. Why none of these counselors didn't do anything further to investigate will obviously haunt the victims' families forever. Because that's their responsibility to make sure that their children are safe while at camp. Yeah, absolutely. I would be angry too. Like you just assume. Why would you mm-hmm. assume something's wrong if you think you hear girls crying? Like, I know. Makes no sense. I know. It really doesn't. And I, I do try to have sympathy for the counselors, not the camp itself, because the camp as a whole, there's plenty of problems to go over later in this episode. But these are younger counselors mm-hmm. that it's not like they have experience. It's not like true crime was really what it is today with all the information we know. Yeah. Obviously, we probably would have done something or if we were sure. in that position at that age. But likely they're experience with true crime was like nancy drew you know i mean i just don't know if or maybe they felt scared to even continue looking they're kids and And someone should be out there it's thunderstorming and it's middle of the night i mean does a young even a young teenager or 18 20 year old want to go out by themselves a female in the middle of the night wandering the woods there should be a security guard that you can call out to the campsite and check things out yeah or just have the tents closer together Mm -hmm. so that you you can keep an eye on clearly so many mistakes but yeah well, and to your point, too, I think in the 60s, 70s, and I know my parents have told me this many times, like the sense of security that people yeah. felt was totally different than today. Like oh, yeah. totally people different. left their doors unlocked yes. and, and there's just kids would my dad would ride his bike to the oh, store. Yeah. And like, obviously, in today's world, it's totally different. And, you know, it's yeah. not exactly safe to let your child ride miles to the store by themselves. Yeah. But back in the day, back in you know the 70s, it was totally different. People didn't think about what could happen. And. It, even though things did happen, it just, it didn't, you know, there wasn't social media and the internet. No, so they like, just didn't know what we know or nearly as much about crime. Mm-hmm. Which is why it was did. easier to get away with crimes. Back yeah, then. exactly. Yeah, to your point, I feel like, yes, things happened, but there was no social media, like you said, to spread the, mm-hmm. you know, if, if it's something happened across the country, you most likely didn't hear about it. Whereas right. now you're hearing about everything. So I feel right. like the paranoia has, has gone up because mm-hmm. we're so much more aware of everything that's happening to us. Other than back then, when something happened in a different state, most of the time you didn't hear about it. You know, yeah. you didn't know about it. So to right. you, there weren't that many dangers out there as far exactly. as you were aware. People were not anywhere Educated near. On, yes. On, yeah. and, and like pol- police investigations were different. I mean, mm-hmm. it was much easier to hide from the police, get away with crimes and, and things like that. I mean, just this is like of, 50 years ago. It was a totally different world. Right. It really was. So between 1.30 a.m. and 2.30 a.m., another camper reported she woke up to a flashlight shining its light into tent number seven. The final sounds heard that night, which would later be identified as their last call for help, came at 3 a.m. When two young campers, one at the campsite, Quapa, and the other at Cherokee, reported hearing a scream followed by someone calling out for their mother. And what's so eerie and just horrible is that obviously it went quiet at one point and the rest of the campers were asleep. Meanwhile, the bodies of Lori, Denise, and Michelle were waiting to be found just yards away from their tent. At 6 a.m. on June 13th, Counselor Carla woke up and ventured outside. The night storm had moved on and the air outside was crisp and chilly. Carla exited her tent and walked east towards the staff housing to take a shower. Along the trail, she noticed something odd. And that's when she approached what believed to be a sleeping bag left behind by a camper or dropped off by the buses the day prior. And obviously, she went to look inside the sleeping bag because it obviously looked like there was something in it and that's when she discovered denise milner's body naked and beaten to death denise was bound at the wrist with a gag in her mouth and her body showed clear signs of sexual assault now this is there's some conflicting reports about exactly how the bodies were found there was one that i read that denise's body was actually on top of the sleeping bag so i don't know if that's true or not but the other girls were found inside of their sleeping bags So she went and rushed to tell the other counselors and then they went to the camp owners who before calling the police actually called their lawyers, which is definitely very weird. And based on some of the people and interviews that I saw in in the documentary, they're saying that it it was hard. It was hard to even tell that there was a full body in it because they were they were mutilated and basically it just felt like 
lumps inside of a sleeping bag is, is the best way I can I can describe it. But they found Lori and Michelle actually about 100 yards away from Denise, and they were in in the woods uh, away from the tents. Local police officers arrived on the scene within minutes of the girls being discovered, but the local police knew that the case would be too large for them to handle alone, so they called in the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, or the OSBI. When investigators got to the scene, they determined that Lori and Michelle were the first to die. Their cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head, and their bodies also showed the devastating signs of sexual assault. Oh, it's just so horrible. They're so young, so innocent in their little tent, writing letters to their family. I know, it's, it's the saddest. It's thing. horrific. Ugh. Their tent was covered in blood, and there was also evidence that the perpetrator had attempted to clean the blood using sheets from the beds. Police also found a bloody size nine and a half footprint inside of the tent. And in addition to this gruesome scene in tent number eight, officers also discover nylon rope, duct tape, and a red flashlight next to their bodies. One of the most peculiar findings, though, was that they discovered a pair of prescription eyeglasses that someone had stolen from one of the tents within the Kiowa campsite. As you can imagine, after the three girls were discovered and there's clearly a murderer on the loose, the camp staff told the remaining girls to pack up their belongings quickly and they sent them home. They packed them into the buses and they made their way back to Tulsa where their families anxiously awaited their arrival. The families had actually yet to learn which girls would not be coming off the buses that morning. And obviously I can't even imagine the anxiety filling them as they're waiting there to see if their child gets off of the bus and uh, that'd just be so horrible. Angela, the girl who was supposed to stay in the tent with Michelle, Lori and Denise that night actually said that her parents were not told who the deceased girls were. And one by one, they announced the names. And when it was Angela's turn to exit the bus, she recalls having dropped something and said she didn't hear the staff calling her name the first or second time. But after the third time the staff called her name, she actually exited the bus to find her mother on her knees sobbing because she thought she wasn't on the bus. It also wasn't until the following day when Angela saw Lori Denise and Michelle's photo on the front page of the newspaper that she actually told her mom that I was supposed to sleep in their tent that night. But luckily, I got moved to my troop's tent right before all this happened. And to this day, Angela does not know why her life was the only one that was spared. The investigators obviously had to figure out who did this and figure it out quickly. So they started looking into possible suspects. Their first suspect was Jack Schroff, a local farmer in the region. Investigators found that some of the materials used in the murder came from his property. However, police quickly dismissed Jack as a suspect after he passed a voluntary lie detector test. Police determined that the rope and duct tape had been stolen off of his property and used in the murders. And despite being entirely cleared of any wrongdoing by police, the media continued to go after this guy. His face, along with the title Slayer, was printed in the newspaper, which the article led readers to believe that Jack was the killer. Jack would later end up being hospitalized after being relentlessly harassed by phone calls and threats. After Jack was cleared, days went by before police announced a new suspect. The police decided to bring in a team of three tracking dogs, also known as Wonder Dogs, on June 16th to help them move forward with the investigation. The group promised that these dogs would make a discovery within 48 hours. The dogs would search for nine days without any luck before a major announcement would break this case wide open. On the 10th day of their investigation, the Mays County District Attorney Sid Wise announced their prime suspect was Gene Leroy Hart. Gene Hart was a 34-year-old Native American Cherokee man standing at 5'10 and weighing nearly 200 pounds. Gene was actually locked up and serving a 309-year sentence for burglary as well as for the kidnappings and rapes of two pregnant women. Gene had escaped from Mays County Prison in 1973 and had been at large for four years when the murders occurred. Gene also grew up only a mile away from Camp Scott, so it was very clear that he would be familiar with the area. Gene had actually kidnapped and raped the two pregnant women in 1966 when he was just 22 years old, and this was done in a remote wooded area. Obviously, the police looked at his criminal past and they were like, this guy's familiar with the area, he's done violent crimes against women before. So obviously he kind of fits into their suspect profile. One of the pregnant women that he actually kidnapped and raped recalled that he had used nylon rope and duct tape to subdue them during the attack. Not only did this match what the killer used against Lori, Denise, and Michelle, but she also recalled that Jean made incoherent, bizarre, deep, and guttural noises 
as he sexually assaulted them. That which is so disturbing. Yeah, very disturbing. I don't even like to hear about that. Ugh. So sick. And these sounds were heard by counselors on the night of June 13th. They heard these bizarre noises and they, they were like, oh, it's got to be animal or something, but it could have been Gene. <sighs> so, so disgusting. What's also interesting is that both of his pregnant victims wore prescription eyeglasses and they actually remembered Gene trying them on. Which again, remember at the Kiowa campsite, they found a pair of prescription eyeglasses mm -hmm. that had just been left on the ground. So perhaps if it was Gene, Gene had dropped these eyeglasses after stealing them. Yeah. Gene had also gagged both women, wrapped their entire faces in duct tape, and then just left them in the woods to die. But luckily, one of these women was able to free themselves, and the two of them ended up surviving. But soon after Gene Hart was named the primary suspect in the Camp Scott murders, the Wonder Dogs led investigators to a cave with evidence that someone had been living in it. This cave was only three miles away from Camp Scott and a mere 100 feet from Gene's childhood home. And they found some very interesting items inside the cave, including a pair of sunglasses that were stolen from a camp counselor, duct tape matching the tape that was found at the crime scene, women's underwear, pages from the Tulsa newspaper that matched pages found near the scene, cigarette butts, and four small extinguished burnt tobacco piles arranged in a half circle. And he also had developed photographs of two women. Just so creepy. Investigators also looked in a nearby cave and found writing on the wall that read, the killer was here. Bye-bye, fools. 77-6-17. Investigators thought that these photographs they found of women would ultimately lead them back to their killer as the items were clearly connected to the Girl Scout murders. The photos were plastered everywhere in hopes that someone would identify the women or give the police more information. Lewis Lindsay, who was a prison employee and also a wedding photographer on the side, came forward and told police that the photographs were taken by him. Gene Hart actually worked in the prison's photo lab when these photos were taken, and clearly he stole them. This was all the police needed to link him to the cave and charge him with the murder of the three Girl Scouts, or that's what they thought. Now, before we get into the manhunt for Gene and the trial, we're going to take one last ad break for the day. Guys, let me tell you today about Warby Parker, a new concept in eyewear. Warby Parker was founded with a rebellious spirit and a lofty goal to create boutique quality eyewear at a revolutionary price point. Offering glasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams, Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. Don't let your FSA or HSA dollars go to waste. Put them to good use on Warby Parker prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. And like I said, Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. Their glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Plus, Warby Parker has a really cool, unique feature. They offer a free home try-on program where you can order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days, check them out, and there's no obligation to buy any of them. It ships free and includes a prepaid return shipping label. So you can try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash milehigher. I think the home try-on kit is just so helpful. I find it so much easier to actually try on a pair of glasses in person to see how they really fit on you, how they feel on you. And even though other websites sometimes offer like a virtual thing where you can put glasses on a photo of yourself, it's really not the same as putting them on and being able to look in the mirror and turn around and actually feel what they're like. And what we love about Warby Parker is that every pair of glasses they sell Warby Parker also distributes a pair of glasses to someone in need. Almost 1 billion people worldwide lack access to glasses, and this means that 15% of global population cannot effectively learn or work, which is crazy because glasses were invented 700 years ago. So they partner with nonprofits like Vision Spring to ensure that for every pair of glasses sold, a pair is distributed to someone who needs them. So again, you can try five pairs of glasses for free at home at warbyparker.com slash milehigher. There's a specialist for just about everything, right? When my truck breaks down, I go to a mechanic. And when there's a problem with my shower, I call a plumber because I certainly ain't a plumber. So when you want to get your uneven, crooked teeth fixed, you see an orthodontist because they're the specialists. And that's what sets Candid, the invisible, comfortable, and removable aligners above the rest. While poorly reviewed or insanely priced clear aligner companies use general dentists who have no idea what they're doing, 
Candid only works with orthodontists, the experts. With Candid, the same orthodontist who created your plan is with you from start to finish, so you never have to wonder how you're doing. Your treatment is prescribed and closely monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement. Very important. You can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you, or you can do everything from the comfort and convenience of your own home. Amazing what technology can do. The average Candid treatment is just six months, and you'll start seeing results way before then. But best of all, it costs thousands of dollars less than traditional braces, and it doesn't look as bad. And with your aligner treatment, you'll get Candid's teeth whitening for free. Candid can help you get the straighter, brighter smile you've always wanted. And right now you can save $75 on your Candid starter kit when you get started from home. Or you can book an appointment at a Candid studio near you today. Go to candidco.com slash milehire and use code milehire. That's candidco.com slash milehire. Make sure you use promo code milehire. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit today. Candidco.com slash milehire. Use code milehire. So the manhunt for Gene Hart ended up being Oklahoma's largest manhunt at the time. And the search ended up costing the state over $1.25 million in today's dollars. In the early morning of July 28th, security guards at Camp Scott found a pair of shoes with Denise Milner's name on them. And they were sitting in a bag on the back of the stairs of the Great Hall. The bag was used and it was not one of their evidence bags. The guard reported that they frequently used that staircase and had not seen the shoes there before. So they were confused about how they just suddenly ended up there. The guards reported that an hour before discovering the shoes, they spotted what they believed to be a silhouette of a man in the woods and left Great Hall to investigate. When they returned an hour later, the shoes had suddenly appeared. So security guards believed that someone was stalking the murder scene. On many nights, they reported seeing someone in the woods near the camp So guards tied thin strings between the trees near the crime scene and later found that the strings had been broken and footprints were left around them. That's so creepy. I know. God. So rumors, of course, started going around that Gene was probably hiding out near Camp Scott somewhere. And things started to get really tense on June 24th when about 600 volunteers, many of them who were drunk and armed, surrounded a four mile area close to the camp And some members of the American Indian movement responded with volunteers of their own to monitor this mob of people who were very angry and some of them were intoxicated. So after 10 months of searching, police captured him on April 6th, 1978, at the home of an older Cherokee medicine man named Sam Pigeon. He was wearing women's glasses and he was found with items stolen from Camp Scott, including a blue mirror and a corncob pipe. An investigator explained that medicine men in Native American culture are traditionally non-judgmental and open to helping Native Americans that were true believers. This was likely the reason he gave Gene the ability to elude capture by moving him in with him. Upon his capture, Gene's first words were, you'll never pin it on me. Wow. Literally, that's like admitting Mm -hmm. that he did it, but not at the same time. Yeah. Like... I may have did it, but good luck trying to prove it. Well, kind of. Or he could have been saying, "Yeah, you're, you're pinning it on me and you're never going to be able to do that. Sure. I don't know. But when we get into more of the evidence, it's pretty clear here. In March of 1979, almost two years after the murders, the trial began against Gene Hart. Now, Gene ended up really getting a group of many vocal supporters to support him throughout the trial. And one report states that at the trial, there were 400 local supporters packing the courtroom after a fundraising event held for his defense. The victim's families were shocked and hurt by the support for Gene, and they said that it was as if people saw them as the enemy when they entered the courtroom. Meanwhile, they had just lost all three of their children in such a brutal brutal way, just completely horrific. And at trial, the court barred the prosecution from introducing the similarities between the rapes of the two pregnant women and the Girl Scout murders. And it was because they deemed it to be too prejudicial. Two of the most significant pieces of evidence that were used to connect Gene to the murders were a strand of hair and also semen recovered from the bodies. An Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation chemist testified that the hair found on the tape used to tie up Denise was an exact match to Gene's and that the hair either belonged to him or someone whose hair had the same microscopic characteristics, which this type of hair analysis Mm -hmm. technique is totally discredited by the FBI now. They don't use it anymore. Yeah, because you really can't determine much from a a piece of hair unless you have the hair follicle maybe, but... Right. Yeah. 
pretty outdated. And while investigators were talking with Gene, they figured out that he had undergone a vasectomy. And so this was a big point of confusion. However, an expert ended up testifying that the semen did match Gene still. And after they looked into it further, they found out that his vasectomy had not been entirely successful. So the prosecution used all of the items that were recovered from the cave as evidence against him. Police had found Gene with items stolen from Camp Scott, and these items were also entered as evidence. Multiple people testified against Gene, including camp counselors, expert witnesses, and former associates of his as well. And the prosecution was confident that they had presented a solid case and that the jury would easily convict Gene. Gene had hired lawyers from the Oklahoma City's Native American Center. Piece by piece, the defense took apart the case. They argued that the bloody footprint that was found in tent number eight didn't match the size of Gene's foot and that the fingerprint on the flashlight didn't match him either. So they were able to obtain a semen sample from Gene despite his vasectomy. However, the results came back and they were only able to determine that the semen sample obtained from the girls was a match for a non-white male with type O blood. And Gene did have type O blood and he was Native American. So the prosecution noted that the description only matches 0.002% of the population and therefore the semen had to be his. However, the jury decided that the sample being microscopically similar did not necessarily mean it was an exact match. I also wanted to bring up, too, the fact that his defense was trying to argue that the bloody footprint found in the tent wasn't the size of Gene's foot. Well, remember, Gene went and wiped all the blood off the floor. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a picture of the a bloody footprint. It clearly looks like part of the print was wiped away. So that would make mm -hmm. sense why it wouldn't match. Just wanted to clarify that. Defense attorneys also called in a waitress from a local cafe who testified that she saw convicted rapist William Stevens in the cafe on the morning of the murders, looking anxious. The defense also called on an 11-year-old scout who testified to seeing Stevens at Camp Scott before the murders occurred. Other defense witnesses included Stevens' friend Dwayne Peters, who testified that he had lent Stevens a red flashlight before the murders. On the day of the murder, Peters reported that Stevens returned back to his home with bloody boots and scratches on his body. The friend also testified that later, while the two of them were drunk, Stevens confessed to carefully planning and committing the murders. Stevens denied any involvement in the murders, however, and the samples collected from Stevens and Peters ruled both of them out. But it's interesting how Gene's defense is trying to literally bring other suspects into yeah, the courtroom of and course. try to pass it off to them. And like we said, Gene had a huge group of community supporters, and they argued that the sheriff had planted the evidence in the case in an attempt to frame him. And this was a suggestion that was implied during the defense in the trial. And prosecutors began to worry that all of these accusations would convince the jury that the prosecution's case was just too weak. And of course, after only five minutes of deliberation, the jury returned with a very shocking verdict. They found Jean Leroy Hart not guilty of the rape and murder of Denise Milner, Lori Farmer, and Michelle Gousset. And jurors explained their decision, saying that they just believed there were too many loose ends to the case and that the prosecution did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Jean's supporters cheered and wept with joy in the courtroom following the verdict, which was an experience that just shocked and devastated Denise's mother, Betty. Jean himself placed his face in his hands and cried. He then returned to prison to continue his 300-year sentence for his previous crimes, and the sheriff and the OSBI declined to reopen the case and investigate further even after this verdict because they believed that he really was guilty of these murders. Only two months after the not guilty verdict was rendered, Gene Hart died of a heart attack at the age of 35 while imprisoned. His funeral was attended by 1,300 people, and it was the largest in Mays County's history. Of course, this verdict left their families completely dissatisfied and honestly devastated. Although he had returned to prison, many believed that the ruling was a sign that the justice system further failed these three innocent girls and their loved ones. In 1996, a group of locals put together a petition and got a ton of signatures on it, and this was to begin a grand jury investigation on the case. The investigation was never materialized. This investigation never actually happened. However, their petition did offer two men named Frank Justice and Sony James as possible suspects. 
Frank Justice was a friend of Gene's who had bragged to others that he had found the writing on the cave walls before investigators even discovered the cave. Frank's alcoholism and criminal activity led him to be arrested dozens of times. And in 1990, the OSBI questioned him about his whereabouts during the time of the killings. And Frank was very evasive with his answers. The other suspect that the group had offered up was Sonny James, who was a petty criminal and Frank's nephew. He was 16 at the time of the murders, and James was acquitted of the first degree murder and later killed someone who swindled him out of some money. William Stevens died by suicide in 1984 while imprisoned on kidnapping, robbery, and rape charges. In 2011, a man convicted of check fraud and embezzlement named John Russell announced that he was making a documentary about the film entitled Candles. John claims that while he was serving time in the Ottawa County Jail in 1979, a fellow inmate named Carl Lee Myers confessed to him that he had committed the Girl Scout murders. He claims his attempts to contact local authorities about the confession were unsuccessful. And Carl Lee Myers died in prison in 2012. So then in 1990, the FBI conducted genetic testing that revealed that one in 7,700 Native Americans could actually match the semen found inside of the victims, which eliminates 99.88% of Native Americans as suspects and really narrows things down. But at this time, no new suspects had been named in the case. And while the OSBI officially named Gene as the killer, nobody had been convicted of the murders, leaving everyone feeling dissatisfied. So at this point in time, the case is unsolved. And obviously there's a lot of people that theorize that, you know, if it wasn't Gene, then maybe it was somebody else, or maybe there was multiple people involved in the murders. It's very interesting that on the night of June 13th, Angela Sweet, along with other counselors, reported seeing multiple flashlights out in the woods. So maybe there was multiple people involved in the murders. In 2008, the OSBI allowed experts from private laboratories to retest biological samples taken from the crime scene. A sample taken from one of the victim's pillowcases was found to have a partial female DNA profile that did not match two of the victims and could not be conclusively matched to the third. Which this basically suggests that if it's not one of the three girls that were murdered, perhaps there was a female present at the murder scene. Sherry Farmer herself has stated that I've always felt in my gut that there was a girl present. And given the DNA results, you have to wonder if there wasn't also a female who took part in the murders. But despite this, Sherry is still convinced that Jean was the actual person that murdered her daughter. In 1989, Reverend Gerald Manley told the media that he was present during the murders and could identify what he claimed were two of the four perpetrators. However, he failed to convince the police of his story. But a private investigator who Gerald recounted his story to under hypnosis, as well as passing of polygraph tests, says she believes him. Gerald was a United Methodist pastor who lived in Chateau, which is about 11 miles away from Locust Grove, which is where the girls were murdered. According to Gerald, on the day of the murders, he was driving and ran out of gas when two young men stopped to help him. He said that he befriended the men as he believed they needed a Christian influence. The men who Gerald claims had been drinking drove him to get gas, and he reported that they discussed a purse that they had stolen from Camp Scott. Gerald then went alone to visit a friend in Tulsa and later returned to Chateau to find one of the men he met. At some point in the night, he claimed that he pulled over on the side of the road to take a nap when one of the men woke him up. The man said he wanted to take him to see other people, which basically led Gerald to a Girl Scout tent at Camp Scott. Gerald claims that outside of the tent, he saw two men he didn't recognize. And after he reluctantly entered the tent, he claims he saw two sleeping bags that appeared to have bodies in them and the body of one of the victims on the floor. Gerald then claimed that the men picked up the girls and began to carry them outside, but dropped them after hearing a noise. What the fuck? Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Gerald reported that he has told the story to police numerous times, but they have never followed up with him further. Uh, that's very, very weird. I yeah. mean, yeah. the multiple flashlights, to me, it seems like there definitely could have been multiple people because mm -hmm. also three bodies yeah. taken out of the tent. Like, Gene had time to go mm -hmm. back in and out without mm -hmm. anybody hearing or seeing. Well, I mean, people did hear and they just didn't do anything. Yeah, that's true. But I just, it's just hard to believe that. Yeah, and if there was multiple people, you would think somebody would have came out. There would have been enough noise. Like, yeah. I don't know. It don't just know. doesn't make any sense. No, it really doesn't. What's also interesting is that a command meeting after the OSBI agents enlisted the Wonder Dogs to make a discovery in the case, one of the agents actually reported that a Cherokee medicine man had placed a curse on the tracking dogs and said that each of them would die. All of the agents at the time laughed off this suggestion except for OSBI agent Harvey Pratt 
who was actually a Cheyenne Arapaho man. Agents reported that the dogs would often lose their scent trail and begin walking in circles, as well as looking up as if the scent had disappeared into the sky. Also, later on, one of the wonder dogs suddenly died, but this was likely due to heat exhaustion. But Agent Pratt reported that after the cave was discovered, he took part in a traditional Cherokee ceremony intended to give him spiritual guidance in the case. And immediately after the ceremony, Agent Pratt received a call stating that one of the women in the photographs was identified. Some of the Cherokee then asked Agent Pratt if he was a medicine man, to which he denied that he was and stated that he was a Christian. But after the ceremony, one of the two remaining wonder dogs suddenly ran in front of a car and was killed. While Agent Pratt investigated the case, various people, including deputies at Mays County Jail, claimed that Jean Hart was a shapeshifter. They claimed that Jean was basically a skinwalker, which we've mm-hmm. talked about uh, with Skinwalker Ranch, which is, an, is mythical, obviously, but a lot of Native Americans believe in skinwalkers who are medicine men that can basically transform themselves into different types of animals. And or there's some really beings. like freaky evidence for that. Yeah, there really is. It's honestly, honestly kind of kind of believe it a little bit. Yeah. Definitely don't rule it out. I don't know. Gene Hart was also reported to be part of a Cherokee group known as the Kitawa Nighthawk Society. And this society was founded around 1900 and sought to protect the traditional old ways of the Cherokee tribal culture through religious nationalism. This group sought to resist the U.S. government's takeover of their tribal lands and forced assimilation practices. The idea that he was a part of this society uh, is kind of controversial because yeah. there's some sources out there that say it was the sci- society that taught gene shape-shifting magic that it was, you know, kind of more rooted in, you know, sort of the mythical aspects of the Cherokee traditions and culture versus them being more of like a political activist group, I mm-hmm. guess is the best way to explain it. Mm-hmm. But Agent Pratt continually used different forms of medicine to aid his investigation. While he was investigating, he enlisted the support of his brother. Agent Pratt and his brother were both raised in the Native American culture, and they became very concerned when they heard the rumors about Gene Hart's shape-shifting abilities. A jailer at Mays County Jail had actually informed Agent Pratt that Gene repeatedly taunted him with the claim that he could slip through the bars of a cell and escape. Because again, Gene Hart escaped from jail twice. The first time he used a hacksaw, and the details of the second escape are unknown, which... Who knows what happened there? Yeah. Agent Pratt also described feeling like Gene Hart's presence never left and that he could feel him everywhere. And one night, Agent Pratt reported that him and his brother were sitting by a fire when a cat pounced on his chest, yelped, and then bolted off. Which, you know, I don't know if he's trying to say that was Gene as a cat doing that or that it was just weird that that had happened when they were investigating. Investigators also found that the Cherokee were very reluctant to talk to them about shape-shifting due to the perceived danger of encountering one and the danger of divulging such information to outsiders. Mm -hmm. An agent actually attempted to consult a medicine man named Crying Wolf about the belief. And while he confirmed many Cherokee believe in the existence of shape-shifters or skinwalkers, he refused to discuss it much further. Crying Wolf did say that he did not believe Gene possessed these abilities. And instead, he thought that he was using the legend in order to benefit his image and make himself appear to others as if he was actually performing these rituals or had these abilities. So who really knows? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's, that's a tough one. Mm-hmm. I mean, none of us are Native Americans. So we don't really know that much about it. But, but I, what we do know, I mean, there's some yeah, there's a, things. There is. It, it yeah. really is. Look I mean. into it further if you don't know much about it. Skinwalkers. Mm-hmm. But in the end... The Milners and the farmers later sued the Magic Empire Girl Scout Council, but were unsuccessful. And Betty Milner has said years later that the grief from her daughter's death still consumes her, and she hasn't even been able to bring herself to visit Denise's grave since her funeral. My only question is, is that was he the only one? The things that were done that night, it's hard to believe that one person could do that. I have faith that, that some, there will be some answers and somebody will come forward, something. I felt like you know I had to step into Lori's shoes and take care of them too. At the end of every conversation or, or phone call, I always say, I love you, you know, because you just never know. I would like people to think of us as ordinary with a life of ups and downs and good and bad. She was extremely bright, uh, and I always wonder what she would have accomplished. Sherry Farmer went on to establish the Oklahoma chapter 
of an organization called Parents of Murdered Children, which is a group that provides support and assistance to families of murder victims. Michelle Gousset's father felt like their family was ignored by both prosecutors and police, and because of this, he helped establish the Victims' Bill of Rights in Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Victims' Compensation Board. But in the aftermath of the murders at Camp Scott, they immediately shut the camp down, and it remains abandoned to this day. And it's that very is creepy so out there. Creepy. Okay, so there's a clip of it. Yeah, people go out there and visit it. Oh, that is scary looking. Yeah, as you can imagine, it's a lot of people go out there for mm -hmm. paranormal reasons, and but wow, is that yeah. the pool? Mm -hmm. Empty very pool. Very eerie. Yeah, there's uh, actually still like a lot of items there. Yeah, yeah, but it could have just been from squatters or people coming through. I mean, it looks like children's toys though. Yeah, but there. I don't know if they're from the camp. Yeah, that'd be a long time to be yeah, out there. Yeah. Wow, that is Foundation, really yeah. creepy looking. Yeah. Oh, wow, there's the Great Hall. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as of today, this case is still unsolved. But like their family said, they are really hoping that one day they will have answers and maybe this could be solved. They're definitely not giving up hope. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a very strong possibility that there was multiple people involved whether or not they actually committed the murders or not mm -hmm. it seems like you know there's a lot of reports of the multiple flashlights out there and just weird things weird noises i don't know i feel like there could be others involved and even though gene now is dead obviously it would still mean so much for their family to have the answers and to in a way have justice that at least a person has been named and and they know they are responsible for it at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, I just worry that the samples, the DNA samples are, you know, they degrade over time and they probably weren't stored correctly and, you know, maybe they'll be able to use it in future tests, but it's possible. It's possible they won't be. I and know. this could just be unsolved forever. Well, for their family's sake, I mean, they're still dealing with the pain to, of it to this day, so let's just hope that one day they have some answers. Absolutely. But we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode here. We definitely want to hear your thoughts on this case. Yes. Do you believe Gene was the one who committed the crimes? Or do you think it was maybe one of the other suspects? Or maybe someone that's unknown to this day? Totally. We will be back next week. But until then, guys, keep on taking your mind a mile higher.